Okay, hello everyone. Well, we are going to try doing something very risky and very ambitious here. We uh, uh, have been itching to actually get back to doing some real science on our physics project. Um, we were going to do this anyway at this time and we figured we might as well uh, do it with everybody participating. So we're going to try and figure out some, some uh, uh, physics questions that we've been interested in and uh, we hope um, you all can participate and make suggestions and make this happen more efficiently. So let me define the problem that we're actually trying to work on. So we're interested in what is spin? What is uh, quantum angular momentum? And uh, just let me, let me give some sort of introduction to this and then um, we will get probably fairly technical uh, and um, uh, hopefully people on the chat can explain a little bit if it gets really technical. Now this may just totally derail. We may not figure this out at all, but um, uh, this is this is not like an easy problem that um, is you know your average homework problem. This is a problem where kind of uh, uh, quantum spin was discovered uh, about a hundred years ago now, and we still don't really kind of know what it is. So we're being pretty ambitious to try and figure out something here. Okay, so what what's what's the basic idea? So. Linear momentum is a thing, we think we understand what linear momentum is in the context of our models. We think linear momentum corresponds to the flux of causal edges through time-like hypersurfaces. We can explain a little bit more what that means. Uh, that's linear momentum. Angular momentum is all about things spinning around and uh, uh, ordinary angular momentum, what's often called in quantum mechanics orbital angular momentum, can sort of have any value but the surprising thing, well, actually that, that's not even true, but, but the, the surprising thing is that even an electron, which traditionally has been thought of in quantum mechanics as a zero sized object, still has a non-zero uh, spin, which is like angular momentum. And it has a non-zero spin whose value is a half H bar, half Planck's constant over two pi. And one of the things that we think we know about quantum mechanics is that spin is quantized. Um, in fact, angular momentum is quantized. Um, in units of h bar or units of a half h bar. So um, the question um, uh, question that we have here is what is the what is spin in the context of our models? What is angular momentum in the context of our models? And I have an idea about this. I think Jonathan also has an idea about this. Our ideas might be the same. They might be completely different. We don't know because we haven't talked about it yet. Um, the uh, uh, and uh, we also have Jose Martin Garcia here, who's a uh, uh, general relativist. His day job is uh, leading a team in our algorithms R&D group. Um, but uh, I'm hoping Jose can help us with various questions about relativistic ang angular momentum. So maybe we should start off just for people's benefit, just defining what angular momentum is. I mean, ordinary momentum, uh, angular momentum in the, the sort of the most simple minded version is angular momentum is what R cross P. R is a R is a dis, uh, is a is a, uh, a displacement vector. P is a momentum vector. And so, first question that I would have, uh, maybe Jonathan's just itching to say that he thinks he knows the answer already. But um, uh, he's also eating, so we'll, we'll let him. Um, uh, um, the uh, um, uh, talk a little bit about what the relativistic generalization of um, of, of angular momentum is. I don't know whether we think that's useful. I mean, I, I look, I have a definite idea for what this, what, what we may be looking at, but maybe we should start off talking about relativistic angular, angular momentum. Um, and uh, uh, so let's, um, let's see, Jose, do you want to, do you want to, well, f first of all, uh, let, let's start off with some basic definitions of relativistic angular momentum. What, what, is the, what is the relativistic generalization of angular momentum? Okay, so the first thing I think is important here is that we are used to the idea that in three dimensions, angular momentum is a vector. Rotation intrinsically is something that happens on a plane. So angular momentum is better described via an antisymmetric tensor. And so when we go to general relativity or to relativity in general, angular momentum is described via an antisymmetric tensor, which is a plane. It's, it's an accident of three dimensions that a vector describes also a plane. Okay. So the, well, the angular moment, yeah. yeah. 
I mean, you're saying it's something orthogonal to a line, basically. Is that correct? I mean, that the in three dimensions. In in four, for example, imagine, uh, um, say, a situation like in five dimensions, in which you have four spatial dimensions plus one. There, mm -hmm. the 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 three the instead of having three spatial dimensions, we have four spatial dimensions. So we have two orthogonal planes. And so we can have two independent rotations. We can have a rotation on a plane and a rotation in another plane, which is completely independent. And so there will be two scalar angular momentum. And so for example, if we go to the black hole of Myers and Perry in four dimensions, four spatial dimensions, there are two angular momentum parameters. Wait a minute, is that a solution to Einstein's equation in five dimensional space? Yes, so exactly. So in the Kerr black hole has only one parameter because in three dimensions, you can only have one plane of rotation, but in four dimensions, four spatial dimensions, you can have two independent planes of rotation, orthogonal planes of rotation. And so you have two parameters, two A's. And in six so spatial wait a dimensions, so you have three A's. I mean, and one can understand that presumably in terms of the, of the um, uh, of the symmetry group. I mean, it's SOD for d-dimensional space, and there's presumably some, I mean, the, the, we can think of these angular momenta as related to irreducible representations of that group. Correct. And, and can, you, can, can you convert that into this description in terms of planes and so on? Uh, yes, so let's see. So if we are in n spatial dimensions, so we are worried about rotations in SON, then that group has n times n minus one divided by two independent parameters, independent angles. Mm -hmm. So in three dimensions, we have the three Euler angles. And if we go to four dimensions, we will have six independent angles. Uh, three times four divided by two. Which is the dimension of a total anti of an antisymmetric tensor. Exactly, that. because exactly. And, and this is where we go back again to antisymmetric tensors. Rotations are always given by the parameters of an antisymmetric tensor. And these antisymmetric tensors can be like broken into two by two blocks, each one defining an independent rotation. Okay. okay. And by the way, it's, sorry, mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's worth noting that the antisymmetric tensors can also be used to describe classical angular, like sort of non-relativistic angular momentum too, because it, it, as well as doing the, the R cross P thing that you mentioned, you can also take the exterior product of R and P and you also get an anti-symmetric uh, rank two tensor. And that's just in the non, that's e even in the purely realistic case. Right, right, right. But I mean, so I mean, to get an intuition for what angular momentum actually is, I mean, it is, it is what we're talking about here is, you know, there is a direction and then we're talking about planes orthogonal to that direction in some sense, is that right? I would say that's the intuition in three dimensions. In four dimensions, for example, the idea is to say, oh, I have planes, and on each plane, I have a number, which is the, the, the intensity of rotation that we can associate to the angular momentum. And so if, if, we are, if we are in two plus two spatial, remain, spatial dimensions, we have two orthogonal planes, and on each one, I can place one of these uh, so it's like a, a projection of the circulation onto that plane in some sense. And you're saying exactly. how many orthogonal planes are there to project onto? Exactly. Right. So for then, example, uh, something interesting is that now that we know that in, in five, four plus one dimensions, there are holes, more than black holes, there are, for example, black rings. Uh, so there is the black ring with only one parameter which is the Emparan Real. There is the black ring with two parameters, which is called Pomeramsky Sankov, and then there are the black satons, etc. Well, so, okay. So obviously one of the places that I want to understand is what's the generalization of angular momentum to fractional dimensional space? I mean, we've got, you know, what, what you're saying is you can project this sort of notion of circulation onto planes onto the various orthogonal planes that exist in a, in a particular dimensional space. But I mean, the, 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 the overall picture is, you know, angular momentum is associated with some kind of circulation. And I suppose, you know, okay, let's, let's cut to the chase. The obvious thing that, you know, if we think linear momentum is associated with flux 
of um, uh, uh, of causal edges, then we can expect that uh, the somehow angular momentum is associated with circulation of causal edges. And I'm sure that's, I bet that's what Jonathan has, has also decided is the case, or, or maybe not. Yes, yeah, that's pretty much it. Actually, do you mind if I share screen for a second? Just yeah, to kind of ahead. give you an intuition of what I'm thinking about? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So, the, the, okay, it, at least in the quantum context, there's this idea of, uh, of Schwinger that basically anytime you have an angular momentum operator, you can formulate it in terms of basically a harmonic oscillator problem. And so, uh, so okay, this is our analog of a harmonic oscillator for, for a string multiway system, right? So here we have a thing, it's just, it's, it's diverging to two branch pairs, and then those branch pairs are then, the two elements of that branch pair are then reconverting onto a common state and so on. So this is, I think, the sort of simplest case of a, of a sort of, ang of, a, um, of a harmonic oscillator that we can produce in the context of our multiway systems. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. You're claiming, so successively this is adding Ds. It's otherwise operating as a just branch and join, branch, you know, branch and join type thing. Why are you identifying this as a harmonic oscillator? Uh, so, okay, so, so our intuition for how um, sort of, in, okay, in a purely space-time causal graph, our intuition is that, that a, a geodesic bundle can be treated as like the trajectory of a kind of cloud of test particles. Our yep. current intuition, our current, our current best intuition for the associated thing in a multi-way evolution graph is that su such a geodesic bundle is, is treated like a wave packet. In other words, if we, if we think it's correct that the multi-way evolution graph is basically corresponding to, some, uh, to an evolution of some linear superposition of eigenstates, then if you look at a, a geodesic bundle in that multi-way evolution graph, it, it's, it's a, that itself corresponds to a, to a sort of subset of the overall linear superposition of eigenstates, which in quantum mechanics you think of as being a wave packet. So this case, I think, is the, is the sort of minimal case of a multi-way evolution graph where, the, where this, this wave packet, this, if you think of this as being a geodesic bundle, this wave packet corresponds to a simple harmonic oscillator. Explain why. What characteristic uh, does a wave packet have for a simple harmonic oscillator? Well, that it's, that it's periodic. Yeah, in time. Right. And, I mean, okay, and your point here is, in order to make progress through time, all those Ds are getting added so that the thing doesn't fold back on itself and just end up in a, in a closed time-like curve, basically. Exactly. I mean, you can see if, if we just remove these, you'd, you'd end up with just that, which is not super interesting. So yeah, you, you, you have to, as you say, you have to have to, some notion of making progress. Um, okay. I mean, so, we, we could remove the Ds and replace this with an evolution graph. But What's that? We could, I mean, equally well, we could remove the Ds and, rep and say this is an evolution graph. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I mean, we okay, could get fine. the same thing, right? Right. I mean, that might be a little bit clearer, but okay. But so, so the concept here is this is a periodic. This is a thing with periodic behavior, which we can identify mm -hmm. as being like a harmonic oscillator. Do, can we? I mean, just to, in terms of the traditional thinking, just for a second of a uh, in quantum field theory of taking a quantum field as a superposition of different harmonic oscillators. I guess that we could think of. I mean, if we imagine a multi-way graph we could imagine decomposing, it's kind of an interesting idea, we could imagine sort of the analog of Fourier decomposition for the graph as a decomposition into different, uh, you know, into different periodicities of these kinds of whatever we're calling them. I don't know what we're calling these. The, um, uh, it's like one of those, I don't know what the, um, what are those things called? The, the thing scissor lifts or something, right? It's, it's a, right. Um, uh, you, get, you get what I'm saying? So imagine we have an arbitrary uh -huh. multi-way graph. Then we can ask the question: right. Can we decompose that arbitrary multi arbitrary multiway graph into something which is essentially a union of graphs that correspond to different uh, Fourier components with different periodicities? Yeah. So, it, it, in effect, what you're doing is you're kind of it's almost like you're tracing the evolution of particular branch pairs or particular combinations of branch pairs. Yes, right. And and saying those are those are periodic, but they may be combined with other ones. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's an interesting idea in its own right. The sort of Fourier decomposition of a graph, um, in right. in terms of elementary kind of periodic graphs. But okay, I'm I'm derailing <laughs> you because what your your basic claim is this is like harmonic oscillator, and I kind of agree. Right. Okay. I, yeah. I, this is still this is a very speculative proposal, we should say. But this is kind of my, this is my current uh, conjecture about this. So if we then look at this causal graph, unsurprisingly, we get this periodic looking thing. Yep. Um, and so, 
imagine now you set up a time like hypersurface. We set up some vertical line in this in this causal graph. So then there are these causal edges that are, get, that are intersecting with that time like hypersurface. So we have some kind of momentum going on here. But it's not really linear momentum, right? Because yeah, I understand. Uh, free, I understand. It's going to be circulation. Going. If we look at it from above, those things are going to be going back and forth. Or, or yes, in, right. in more generality, they're going to be going around. Right. So, so, so my basic claim is um, you, it's, it's not good enough to just look at the total flux through that hypersurface. What you actually have to do is that you have to decompose it. You have to take the, the total flux minus the, the, you have to take the net flux, which is basically the linear momentum, and then the total flux minus the net flux, which I think is the angular momentum. That's my current conjecture about how this total is work. flux minus net flux. What do you mean? So here we, you know, so, so if you just if you just consider the multi-way system up to this point, for instance, um, so our total flux is we have two causal edges, but our net flux is we have zero causal edge. You know, there, there was no for for every causal edge going left to right, there was one going right to left. I, I think I mean I I think the momentum is going to correspond to net flux. I think I think the angular momentum is going to correspond to something that is more like. A, uh, a cycle in this graph. I mean, in other words, because we're, we're no, I, used I'm, to looking I'm at these that graphs the, splattered into two dimensions. What's that? No, I, I'm saying that the momentum is the net, the linear momentum is the net flux, and then everything that's left is the angular momentum. Well, okay, but what I'm saying is that, that if you were to imagine looking at this graph sort of from above, right? Mm -hmm. The question is what you would end up seeing. I mean, Im imagine that you're looking at the, the uh, the sort of the, the time like, you know, things that are going in, in um, uh, that, that are, are going in partly space like directions. So, in other words, they're going through time like hypersurfaces. The mm -hmm. question is if you look at the thing sort of from above, do you see essentially a circulation of causal edges around a particular axis in the, um, uh, uh, in other words, you're looking, you're looking at some uh, time like vector and you're asking around that time like vector. Do you see essentially a circulation of causal edges? Mm -hmm. Yep, I think um, that's probably correct. So let, let's see if we can actually make a. Um, Sorry, I'll uh, stop sharing. Oh, okay. Well, the. Well, right. do, you, do, you, do you want me to try and make it? Well, no. I mean, what, one of us should try to actually make a more non trivial example of. Um, uh, let's see here. Let me go ahead and share screen here. Um, Okay, I was I was thinking. Let's try to make a more non-trivial example of um, uh, of something like that that has some. Oops, I need to I need to use some. Um, all right, let's see if I can um, just. Uh, I wanted to try to make a non-trivial example where we could see essentially from above in the causal graph we can actually see essentially circulation around around an axis in the causal graph, because then the thing that I want to get to is. Um, uh, I mean, we have to understand why this is quantized, right? And I sort of have an idea about that. Okay, okay let, let, let's let's put up your your um, uh, your multiway system. Can you tell me either or send me your multiway system? Uh, send me the rule for your multiway system. In some form or another. There we go. Okay, good. Um, all right, here goes. Okay, let's see if, uh, okay, there we go. All right, so now um, what we're interested in is can we make something with more, uh, essentially with, with X and Y coordinates here? So can we introduce another, what we want to do is introduce something which is going to have, um, uh, in a, in, instead of just being this, this two-dimensional thing or you know, one-dimensional harmonic oscillator thing, let's try and make it a two-dimensional one. Seem reasonable? Well, yeah, I mean, we can just introduce a third character. Okay, it's as easy as that. You think? Um, all right. So you think you think we just have to say something like, um, uh, well, let's just get a goes to d, but we're going to fix those d's in a second. Um, b goes to x a, c goes to x a, and then what do you think we we you you think we just need to say uh, d um, goes to x a, d goes to x a. Really? I think the important the important thing here is to break symmetry to find some sort of helicity. Helicity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, but I think right we're going to need that. But let, let's just see here if we have um, 
uh, in this state's graph. Okay, so that's our state's graph. Now let's take a look at the causal graph. Is this what I want, the multi-way causal graph of this? At least initially, I think so, yeah. Okay, so maybe what I want is the causal graph structure. Well, actually, I could just have the causal graph there, and I think I want a graph 3D of that. And let me only go five steps. And that's absolutely useless. I'm not seeing anything interesting here. Um, maybe I want to, uh, I mean, you understand what I was trying to see. What I was trying to see was something where we could actually see essentially uh, circulation. We need a different embedding. Yeah, we need a different embedding. So let, let, let's try, um, uh, well, what, what um, I mean, I don't know what, um, oh boy. That's already quite incomprehensible. All right, what's happening here? So we want, uh, where is the initial state? Let's see, how do we, how do we get, um, uh, can we get, um, how do we display the initial state in the causal, in the multi-way system? I mean, we could just do, we can do highlight graph A. No, but isn't there a way of displaying the initial state? Isn't there an option to multi-way system that displays the initial state? Uh, initial events, yes, but not initial states. But we're actually, initial events is fine for this, right? Because there's a causal graph. Oh, uh, yeah, I think it's it's something like show initialization event. I can't actually remember the name of the option. Um, one sec, maybe someone else can look this up. Uh... All right, but in any case, the, the, the question here, um, uh, let's see, we have various comments on our live stream, and I'm not sure. Include, include initialization events true. Okay. Um, and I want that for the multi-way system here. Right. Great. That's extremely unuseful. That initialization event is disconnected from all other events. Oh, okay, yes. Let's... There's a reason we did that. <laughs> okay, but here, okay, here what we're seeing is, uh, we can see that as over time, we're getting to those events that have more Xs in them, right? And so my hypothesis here, so I think Jose is correct that there is no, in this particular case, there is no circulation, right? This this thing has, uh, if we go around a, um, uh, we go around there, we're not going to see any um, any net circulation. Um, uh, okay, I'll see if we can zoom in. Sure, let's go another two hundred percent here. Um, Okay, I want to come back to the question. All right, so so the hypothesis, my hypothesis, so there are two pieces to this. First hypothesis would be that somehow angular momentum is associated with circulation of these causal edges. But I don't know what circulation means. And I don't know, I mean, that, um, uh, and I, okay, the next question is why should there be quantized circulation? And I'm, I'm, I'm somehow reminded of, of uh, quite, uh, inappropriately, probably rotons in, in liquid helium four, the um, you know quantized uh, uh, rotation in in fluids, um, and that may be a completely incorrect um, uh, thought. But I mean, the the question is, how would we define in in this network situation? How would we define? Um, I mean, in a, in a sense, we can look at divergence of causal edges, right? That that's a that's a uh, that we think is related to the Lagrangian. Um, the question is, what is the analog of the curl or the or some, uh, uh, you know, I mean, we're trying to set up differential forms basically on this um, on this uh, 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 graph type space. How do we how do we do um, um, uh, how do we think about differential forms? So, I mean, we think of tensors. If we're trying to put a function on this uh, on this graph, the way we're thinking about that is every edge has some kind of um, uh, 
uh, you know, the, 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 uh, let's say we're putting a scalar function on the graph. We're just saying every node on the graph has some weight. Um, and the function is described by, uh, you know, that distribution of weights on the graph. If we're trying to put a vector function on the graph, then we're saying that at every, uh, at, that every edge, every single edge going out from a node, I mean, let, let's, let's take a more realistic example. Um, let's, let's say we've got, uh, let's pick one up here. Um, let's say, let's just find one here for a second. Um, uh, let's find a, let's find a convenient, um, I think we've probably got one in here that we can just pick up for a second. Um, let's try, let's try one of these guys. Uh, there we go. Okay, let's just try. Um, okay, so what we're imagining is to define a function Actually, we, we've actually got, wait, okay, to define a function on this graph, right? What we're saying, uh, uh, we could take a more trivial example. Let's say we have a grid graph and um, uh, to define a function on this grid graph, what we'd be saying is just put a value at each node here. If we want to define a, um, uh, um, yes, we, uh, somebody's commenting on the live stream that we need uh, hyper edges, we will want hyper edges in a minute. Um, and uh, uh, we can also think about, okay, so so here we can think of a scalar function by just being a, a weighting on each node. We can potentially think of a vector function as being a weighting on these edges, I think. And we can potentially think of a tensor function as being a, a you know, a, a rank two tensor function, for example, as being some weighting on, um, uh, pairs of, of edges from a node. So my question is, first question is what is the represent, wh wh how do we think about differential forms? How do we think about anti-symmetric tensors and so on in that context? Anybody, Jose, Jonathan, thoughts? Did I lose you guys? I, I, I don't know what to say. Um, okay, all right, fair enough. All right. Jonathan? Uh, I'm, I'm still thinking about it. I mean, we... we... Look, totally unsymmetric yeah. tensor, one feature of a form is that it's defining essentially some kind of volume. Right? And it's, it's defining something where instead of just thinking about... Um, I mean, there are these, there are these I'm, I'm remembering these like egg crate pictures in the Misenathorn and Wheeler gravitation book. Um, yeah, right, were... right. I mean, so, so the, okay, the, the place I was going with my previous response was, so we, this gives us, in the same way as we have this notion of density of causal ledges, right? That's ultimately what we care about when we think about momentum. What I, what I was talking about earlier is only a definition of angular momentum density. So then in standard, uh, for this case of standard relativistic angular momentum, if you have the angular momentum density tensor, which I think is a rank three tensor, which is anti-symmetric in the first two indices, you then have to integrate that over a space-time uh, hypersurface. And, th and that gives you the actual angular momentum tensor. And so my let's, claim is- Let's look up, can we write down the actual, uh, I hate to do this, but we can just search for relativistic angular momentum on the web. We'll see what horrifying things we find here. Well, it's the orbital. Do you, do you want to know the orbital angular momentum density? Or, Are we going to click on a Wikipedia link? Sure, let's click on a Wikipedia link, see if it actually defines anything here. Okay. Where is the relativistic version of this? Yeah, I, I want to know what the... Um, it's basically... Um, so so um, the, 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 the orbital angular momentum density tensor in indices alpha, beta, gamma is basically the, it's the it's the difference between the spatial the, the spatial vector component minus the um, sort of set, but minus the center of mass uh, vector times t beta gamma minus um, sort of the, right. the same. You're, you're defining it in terms of the uh, of the energy momentum tensor. Yes, right. Which we which we know how to compute, or at least we think we do. But so, so, sorry, I have a question. So, are you thinking of the angular momentum of a field or of a particle? Well, ultimately, we want to get to particles. Ultimately, we want to be able to understand why it is the case that uh, this angular momentum is quantized. Right? Because none of the other quantities we're looking at, energy momentum and so on, these are not quantized in the ordinary sense. Now, now, one thing that might be worth thinking about 
is in the context of your model of a harmonic oscillator where things are quantized, can we understand? Okay, so let's take this first, um, uh, the, um, let's take this first thing. So harmonic oscillator should have quantized levels of, moment, of, of energy, right? Can we understand that in your model of the harmonic oscillator? Can we understand what a, you know, what multiple quanta of energy in the harmonic oscillator would look like? So in other words, we want to have a, a sort of, uh, I mean, this I suspect is a single instance of a single mode of the harmonic oscillator. Is that what you think also, Jonathan? Yeah, that sounds plausible. So what we would imagine is that, you know, an additional quantum of energy in this harmonic oscillator. So again, the energy is supposed to be the flux of causal edges through space-like hypersurfaces. So that, in this case, that energy would be, well, we have to get the causal graph for this, but let's just make the causal graph for this particular thing. Um, Speaking of which, I mean, uh, just on the, on the previous point, so I, I'm still not convinced we have to make a distinction between the uh, angular momentum of particles versus the angular momentum of fields. No, in the end, because, we will not have to. In because if we, have we have a notion if we have a notion of a, of a stress energy tensor that goes down to the level of individual causal edges, then we can just treat everything as being a mass energy momentum distribution. Right, so I mean, my suspicion is that what's gonna end up happening is the reason there's quantization of, of this is because of something to do with counting cycles in this graph. And something like that, what's gonna happen? Okay, complete speculation here, that different, okay, possibly, different spins are gonna to correspond to the existence of different types of cycles in the graph. Like for example, one type of cycle in the graph might be just a single, you can follow the arrows and go around in a circle type thing. I mean, something like, more like non-trivial homotopy in, um, I mean, so what, what is the analog? Okay, next, next mathy question. Uh, you know, we understand homotopy in, um, you know, what we're looking at, let, let's say S1, you know, the, we're asking the question, how do you put, uh, how do you embed a circle? How do you embed, and then how do you embed a, a, something, you know, with more degrees of freedom, more like a sphere on this graph? Am I, am I making sense? I mean, we can always have, for any graph, we can, we can say, you know, what are the cycles in the graph, right? And then the question is, is there a generalization of cycles? So cycles are like the pi one homotopy, I would think, of something. What is the analog of things like the pi two homotopy in a graph? Everybody is silent here. I mean, I, well, I mean, yeah. we're, all, all we're doing, I guess, is just imposing some edit distance metric on causal ledges, right? Because the, the, the analog of a smooth of a smooth transition between, you know, of a sort of unit interval transition between two spaces is some. Uh, you're, you're making some statement about if we, we, we can add and subtract causal edges uh, as long as we don't do too many at a time or something. Possibly, but what I'm imagining is, I mean, my, my thought was that the presence of quantization in something like angular momentum would be a consequence of the fact that basically you're looking at uh, the, you know, the closure of a cycle in this graph and that the, the presence of, um, uh, and that somehow the reason that you're getting sort of, you know, units of angular momentum is it either closes or it doesn't or something. And then the higher, some higher order version of that, that might be sort of the, you know, that there might be sort of the two tensor version of that, that is instead of going round in a single, I, I don't know what the generalization of a cycle is in a graph. I don't know what, I mean, just like we can say, if we're talking about, you know, a grid graph here and we, we're saying, let's, let's imagine that the vector function on this grid graph is something which puts weights on these edges. Let's imagine that a tensor function is something that puts weights on pairs of edges at every node. What's the analog of a cycle? So a cycle is you follow the vector edges effectively and you see whether you can get back to the beginning again, right? So, right, so it's a branch pair convergence. Yes, but, but I mean, so, so isn't this the analog, I mean, in, in the Riemann tensor or something, you're going around, you're parallel transporting some, some vector around some, some cycle, right? What's the generalization of that? Is there a generalization of that? So just, sorry, go on. I was going to mention that 
when assigning topological properties of this kind, there are two types of approach. One is using path, paths, which will be cycles always one dimensional. The other one will be generalizing the, the cycles to spheres. And for example, trying to find whether a manifold has a hole because you can surround it with a sphere and you cannot construct, con contract the sphere to a point. Right. So in that sense, there is a generalization, higher dimensional generalization of, of cycle to spheres and n spheres. And well, I mean, in general, but, but to, to compute things like Betty numbers or something for our, we can't do that directly for our graphs, right? Because we don't have any notion of topology. We don't have face data. I mean, these aren't, or, or, or can we construct something like a simplicial complex out of these things? I mean, that's, if we had, if the thing that we have was a simplicial complex, we can, you know, go to town and compute, um, you know, I mean, if we have, you know, let's say we have some arbitrary, I don't know what these, um, uh, what could we do? Some kind of, um, is this the right syntax? No. Um, you know, if we have a mesh like this and we can compute for this, uh, do we have, do we have a Betty number thing? What, what do we have? We have an Euler number. Um, what does this do? Does that, does that compute? Will that compute the, um, wow. Okay, that's a very whole thing, right? It has lots of holes in it. So that will give us, I mean, that is something that we can compute from the simplicial complex, but I don't know what the, um, uh, um, what the analog of that is for, well, okay. What you're saying, Jose, is you're talking about, about you know, contracting to a point um, and so on. I think you're talking about computing these kinds of topological properties, are you not? Yes, indeed. But so the question is, how would we compute those topological properties for one of these graphs? Given that we do not have, we don't have the face data. We, all we have is the zero dimensional, you know, connectivity information for the zero dimensional uh, uh, pieces of this. I mean, the, um, okay, let's see. Um, we have various questions on our live stream here. I'm not sure. Let's, let's, we take a, a, a sort of a break and look at this. Um, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, there, there's somebody's commenting here. Lizard is commenting that everything is space and that particles come from features of space. Yes, that, that is the idea. Um, that there's a background structure of space and that particles are, in some sense, uh, uh, localized, top, quotes, topologically stable features of space. Um, and uh, someone's asking about density of self loops. I'm not sure how relevant that is. Um, uh, what would two interacting oscillators look like? It's a can of worms, I think. Um, uh, let's see. Um, uh, Sid is asking, can we discuss the notion of action? Yeah, we think that action, which is the integral of the Lagrangian, is um, uh, uh, that the Lagrangian is the divergence of causal edges in uh, uh, in in this in this in the causal graph? Um, do we generate Planck's constant? Yes, Planck's constant is basically related to distance in branchial space. Um, okay, so let's go back. Sorry, we're. we're I'm, I, I want to loop back to this question about harmonic oscillators and um, uh, right, let's see. Tali is asking if we take um, a multiway system that is, let's, let's type in his multiway system. Um, I just want to use that multiway, oops, this multiway system function here. Oh, that was, I think that was the multiway system we originally had, yeah. Um, 
and the statement, okay, so uh, Tally's claim is if this is, if, if energy is the flux of causal edges, then this is violating energy conservation. But I think that is the story of, I, a, um, if I'm not mistaken, that's the story of a harmonic oscillator, right? If you, if you have a harmonic oscillator, you are, um, uh, uh, I mean, you've got, in the classical case, you've got the mass on the spring and you've got the spring and you are looking at the motion of the mass and you're not taking account of the potential energy of the, of the spring, or am I confused? I, I think that's correct. I mean, the, the, the energy momentum tensor in this case, I mean, okay, obviously, strictly speaking, if it, was a, if it were a full stress energy tensor, then the stress terms would take into account the potential energy in the spring, but we don't have that. Right, but I mean, if we just think about the Schrodinger equation, in the case of a harmonic oscillator, you've got a term in the Schrodinger equation, which is a V, a potential term. And right. is it not the case that the energy, the energy as computed as, uh, you know, d psi by dt, um, you know, that does not take account of the energy, quote, stored in the potential energy, does it? Right, right, exactly. Right, so, so it is, so in it, fact, it, correct. It, that at each of these... What's that? At each of these layers, there is, a, there is effectively a constant of integration that manifests as the potential. Right, but so what you're saying is, in this layer, the, the particle is moving... You know, this is like a harmonic oscillator where the particle is moving at this point. It's all kinetic energy. At this, at this layer, it's a bunch of potential energy and not so much kinetic energy and back again. Right? Is that correct? I, mean, mm -hmm. I think that's mm -hmm. the claim. Yep. Okay, so let, if, if, we, if we talk about that, then another quantum of energy would correspond to something where, I mean, the, the, essentially what we'd be asking for is a solution to the harmonic oscillator. You know, how do we turn this into a Schrodinger equation where we can actually say that there is a, you know, that there are multiple causal graphs that quote, solve the Schrodinger equation with those, I mean, the boundary condition here is um, uh, some kind of period, time periodicity boundary condition, right? And what we're saying is with a given, well, except we, we want the, Given the time periodicity, we want different time periodicities. We want the thing to be, to be um, eventually periodic, but we want the frequencies to be progressively higher or lower or whatever. So what we would expect is that there's a version of this that has, uh, you know, th this is a very trivial case, but that there's a version of this that essentially has more where the, where the total periodicity is longer than this or, or whatever. Is that correct? And that's right. what we would expect for a harmonic oscillator if we... Um, um, right. One other thing that's worth saying is that um, our, you know, these definitions of bulk quantities like energy, um, they really assume that you're, you're taking some limit, that, that rather than that, you're, you know, you, that your hypersurface, for instance, isn't of infinitesimal width, that it might actually take up more than one layer. And you're just... So, so, so the, the statement of energy conservation is the bulk statement Rather than, a, rather than a statement about you know, the hypersurface separating any particular two layers in the causal graph. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, th this, is, you know, this is absolutely pathetic in terms of taking large scale limits. We're looking really down at the, you know, at the micro micro code of the, of the system. Um, okay, but I, I want to come back to the, the uh, angular momentum business because, okay, so, so you've sort of convinced me that something like this is like a harmonic oscillator. I think yep. we need a more sophisticated version of the harmonic oscillator where, I mean, uh, it would be nice to get something where there's a family of, I mean, obviously we're not even dealing with hypergraphs here, we're just dealing with strings, where there's a family of these systems which can limit to the continuum harmonic oscillator, which I don't think this one can. I mean, in other words, what does it mean to, be, uh, to limit to the continuum harmonic oscillator? What we would expect is, um, yeah, I'm not quite sure, but I, I bet there's a version of the harmonic oscillator just with strings. Well, it, all it's stating is that the branch pair convergence time is homogeneous in time. Which is a statement of being a bound state. It's a statement of being a, a, an, an eigenstate, isn't it? Right. Okay. But so what? Where, where does that get us? Well, it gets us the, that gets us a class of things which have continuum limits to harmonic oscillators, doesn't it? 
So wait a minute. You're saying, walk me through that again. You're saying, so, so, so the, the the notion that the thing maintains some periodicity is really stating that the rate of convergence or divergence of branch pairs, yeah, the, the, you know, this thing you're computer, you were computing earlier with the with your pair rates function, that this yeah. doesn't change in time. I think. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. I mean, or, or, or changes. Changes um, only as a response of being a driven harmonic oscillator or something. No, no, but I mean, it, it, it is at least recurrent in time. It may not be constant in time. Uh, okay, yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah if, if there are, yeah, if there's more than one harmonic, maybe. Right, but so what you're basically saying is, I mean, it, it's a slightly non-trivial statement because in the most naive version of this, you've got kind of the closed time-like curve version of a bound state where the thing actually re returns to the, to the same state again, right? as opposed to making progress in time. Right. Right. So the question is, the, you know, compare. I mean, the problem is the harmonic oscillator is an idealization. And the question is, you know, imagine a harmonic oscillator. OK, so let, let's start off with, I mean, a harmonic oscillator, it better be the case that the states in later in time in the harmonic oscillator aren't just outright identical to the states earlier in time, because then in our kind of model, because of isomorphism between those states, we were basically that would turn into a closed time like curve. I mean, in with respect to, I mean, you know, many versions of, of drawing a harmonic oscillator in phase space would look like closed time like curves. Whether it matters that we're sort of making progress and generating state that isn't represented that way, I'm not sure. I mean, again, the harmonic oscillator is an idealization. So we can't, you know, if we, if we built a physical harmonic oscillator, we will have to continually, um, you know, prevent the harmonic oscillator from having, um, you know, dissipation with respect to the outside world. And I don't right. know whether the right model of it is a sort of uh, something where you have recurrent states, which would correspond in our model to rather pathologically a close time like curve. But I mean, a harmonic oscillator is in effectively is in effect in a close time like curve because it's it's repeating the same exact states again in that idealization. What, what, is, what is the relevance of the harmonic oscillator to the, to the angular momentum case? So let me propose an idea here. So periodicity is not enough, but something close to periodicity is helical motion. And helical yes. motion is important for spin. In fact, in early quantum mechanics, they found this thing they called Sittebegegung, which was helical motion. And it was a way of describing particles with spin in which the momentum was conserved, but the, but the velocity was not parallel to the momentum because the particle was actually doing a helical motion around the line defined by the linear momentum. So I wonder whether there is something like that could be done here. And by the way, this also happens in classical mechanics. You can find Sittebegegung in classical mechanics. Wait a minute. So I thought Sittebegegung was was the was the um, was instead um, things about uh, uh, being able to have um, uh, like uh, pair production. And and I thought that was a a, a um, I don't know my German, but I thought that was the um, I didn't think that was what that was. But I I'm the I mean this question of of um, I mean helicity is a common way to describe particle spin in, I mean, like neutrinos, for example, famously, you know, tend to have helicity that, uh, you know, they only have one helicity state, assuming they're zero mass. Um, and I mean, the helicity is like polarization of a photon, right? Circular polarization of a photon corresponds to helicity, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Yes, but I, I'm not referring to helicity here. I'm referring to helical motion, to motion in a helix. Because I see. If, if, if somehow it's possible to find a system that displays helical motion here, a particle that I think that's very close to spin and angular momentum already. Right. But I mean, so, so your point is, I mean, we, we keep on coming back to the same thing. If we look at it sort of from above, if we look at it with respect to, I mean, you know, we're, we're talking about something where there is some kind of circulation in, you know, 
in the causal graph, which we have not yet represented. I mean, in other words, we're talking about, you know, if Lagrangian is a divergence in the, of, of causal edges, and um, we're talking about net fluxes of causal edges through a, a time-like hypersurface, neither of those things is capturing this kind of circulatory character, right? In other words, neither of them is capturing the thing that would correspond to, um, I mean, I'm just trying to understand what the, um, it's- can I, can I complete the causal graph thing I was talking about earlier? Yeah. So, oh, by the way, one thing, in the chat, I just posted the, there's both the Wolfram demonstrations thing and the paper for, the, for this, this whole Schwinger idea of decomposing angular momentum operators into sort of effectively eigenstates for harmonic oscillators. Um, it's, I think it's a relatively standard technique. Um, but so my, my point is if the total flux minus the net flux gives you something akin to an angular momentum density, then to get the, the true angular momentum, okay, in relativity, if you have the orbital angular momentum density tensor, then you have to integrate that over a, a, a and, you're, and you're in a D dimensional space time, you have to integrate that over a D minus one dimensional space time hypersurface in order to get the true, uh, angular momentum tensor. I think if we do the same thing here, if we have a d-dimensional you know, causal graph, we, we basically sum the angular momentum density over a, a d-minus one-dimensional hypersurface in that causal graph, that the fact that this is a closed surface is what's going to capture the, the, you know, the, the, this, this uh, you know, helical motion idea that you've been talking about. Okay, hold on, hold on. I still don't understand your total flux minus net flux thing. What do you mean by total flux? You, you mean... I mean, let's so, take one of these examples here. I don't care which one. This, the, the, this one here, for example. Right? Mm -hmm. what do, you, you're talking about a time-like hypersurface, yes or no? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so we can just slice it right down, down here. There's uh -huh. a, a time-like hypersurface for us. Right, right. So if we look at the sort of first bundle of causal edges there, right, we have, we have two going in one direction and two going the other direction. Yep. And so our total flux is four. Yes. And our net well, flux is zero. That's correct. But total flux, we would expect, is related somehow to Lagrangian. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Total flux, and then your net flux is. So then, so then the net flux is the, is the thing that's not. It's not. It's it's momentum, but it's not directed linearly. It's not direct. It, it doesn't have a direction. So it's, okay. or it doesn't well, have. Well, a, what's the what's the net flux in this case? Zero. Okay, but that's the difference, isn't it, between momentum and Lagrangian density? Uh, what, well, Lagrangian density is presumed, I, I thought Lagrangian density was related to divergence at a particular vertex, which is not quite the same thing. So, okay, well, let's try walking through your, your idea here. So you're saying, pick a time-like hypersurface, uh -huh. ask what the sign-independent momentum is. That right. is unsigned momentum. Right, exactly. Which I think is a weird concept, but let's not worry about that for a second. But that is kind of, that's the concept we've been talking about so far, right? Because we, we did, at no point did we specify that it was net flux. We were only talking about total flux. For what? For, well, for, for, the defin for our definition of the energy momentum tensor. Fair enough. Okay. So, so all, you're... Look, all I'm trying to do is I'm trying to, you know, obviously in relativity, you have the T0, zero, zero term, which gives you the energy. You have the TI zero terms, which give you the momentum. And then, and then you have bits of the off, you know, you have the bits of the shear stresses that then give you the angular momentum. You have to, sub, you know, you have to do some vector subtraction of the, the spatial, the space time vector minus the sort of center of mass vector. And I'm trying to figure out what the analog of those, um, those terms are. And I think the answer is, you have the so yeah you, you you compute this total flux which is what's which is what's given by the total angular momentum is there, sorry the total stress energy tensor, then you subtract off the net flux which is the linear part because it's directed, mm -hmm. and then that so so the stuff that remains is the angular co contribution to the momentum, but but, the, but crucially this is still we're still talking about energy momentum density we're not talking about. So, so what we get out is an angular momentum density rather than an angular momentum. Okay, but so then in a particular region, is there some analog of Gauss's law or something that tells us what the possible total angular momentum in a particular region is? Yes, right. Yes, there is. I mean, there, there, there's, a, there, there's a continuity equation, uh, which, uh, is, as you say, basically follow, you know, the, the, the integral version of the continuity equation basically follows from Gauss's theorem in, uh, you know, in space-time. But so how do we work that out? 
how do you work out the conservation equation or what? No, how do we work out? Because what I'm trying to understand is what we should see and, and what, I mean, I'm guessing that there is a graph theoretic property that winds up, be, because, I mean, the question is, why is angular momentum quantized? Because this doesn't explain that. The only way that you can get quantized angular momentum, you know, by the time you're looking at individual causal edges, you're sunk because they're down at 10 to the minus, you know, 93 meter lengths, and they're really tiny compared to everything else we're talking about. The only thing that is going to explain quantization on a large scale is something that is more like a, um, you know, more like one of these things, the presence or absence of a cycle in the graph. I mean, it's, it's similar to, I don't remember how, that, how it works with rotons and liquid helium, where there's, where you, you know, you have a, lots of atoms, but you have the, the net uh, angular momentum is quantized. Um, the, uh, I mean, can't it, can't it basically be a number theory story? In other words, I mean, can't it be that you, you know, you have, suppose you have a couple of, you have a bunch of angular, uh, sorry, you have a bunch of uh, harmonic oscillators and they're all sort of coupled in some way. Then you're going to get, if, if you then integrate over, if you, if you integrate causal, you know, um, sort of something like net causal edges or total minus net causal edges over a space-time hypersurface, you're going to get quantization basically because of um, common divisors and things of the of the period of the periods of the harmonic oscillators. I don't believe it because I think it's it's got to be more generic than that. I mean, in other words, it's got to be, and and I think what's got to happen is, for example, the presence of, um, uh, you know, the different the what correspond to the different irreducible representations of the rotation group, which give you, um, well, okay, we got we got multiple things going on. So one issue is. Uh, we've got the whole question of spinners, which is a whole separate issue of being able to understand why, um, you know, because we think we've got something which is modeling, let's say, d-dimensional space. But in fact, the um, what is the case for particles is that there's a different, you know, we, we want something beyond SOD as the, um, as the symmetry group. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, um, uh, let's see, should we look at this Schwinger's oscillator model for angular momentum? What, what is this? Should, should I look at this here? I mean, um, I mean, I was just trying to explain the, the, um, the thing I said earlier, but you, you were asking about how the harmonic oscillator relates to angular momentum. And I'm sorry, or that there's this result of Schwinger that says you can, if you want to know about, um, angular momentum operators, you, that there's a very, very simple way you express them in terms of, um, eigenstates for two angular for two harmonic oscillators, I think. That, but that's just something where the algebra, where the commutators of the of the um, I mean this this looks like it's just saying that the you can get the commutation relations for the angular momentum operators from two harmonic oscillators. Is that correct? Yes, right. But that's probably just an algebraic fact. That's not a that's not necessarily a structural fact. I mean, it's just uh, an algebraic fact that given two harmonic oscillators with those, I mean, what does look? But if they have the yeah. same com if, you, if they have the same commutation relations, and assuming we know what we think we know what commutators are, it means that their branch like their branchial structure is the same. Okay. Okay. Well, let's think about that for a second. So you're saying that I mean, we we think that commutators are well, we 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 strongly think that commutators are just. You apply this, you know, you have this event followed by this event. So, for example, here A and B might be two different events that you right. could have. So right. these are events that okay. So there's a bunch of events that commute, and uh, A A A dagger don't um, don't commute, but these A Bs commute. Right. And the claim is that the components of angular momentum. But I mean, this is deeply three dimensional. Sure. I mean, and, and for example. You know, a, an obvious question is in this model, if you had n-dimensional uh, angular momenta, would that correspond to n harmonic oscillators, or is this just a trick of three, so to speak? I, I, th I think it does. I, I think it does generalize to n harmonic oscillators. I need to double check, but I think that's true. Okay, but but I want to come back to this again to the uh, to this idea of what really is angular momentum in in um, 
in the relativistic case. I mean, and, and actually, let me ask a different question. Let, let's take go in a different direction. Let's talk about spin networks, where maybe completely irrelevant, but but um, let's just try to understand that in terms of quantized uh, angular momentum operators. Um, the uh, um, um, oh, actually, somebody is pointing out on a on a live stream that if you have one oscillator going in one direction and the other oscillator going in the other direction, they draw a circle, which is absolutely true. And that may be essentially what's going on here in the relation between two harmonic oscillators and angular momentum. Right, right. And if they have the same commutation relations, then the, then the branch pair convergences and divergences in the multiway system, which is what we care about for this example, should be the same. I see. So your, your point is, this is a toy model. So your point is, if we did this, right? You, we should be able to model this. And instead of getting a back and forth here, this thing should be going, well, why don't we do this? Come on, we can, we can do this. We can make something where, where instead of this being just a flat, uh, you know, one dimensional thing going back and forth, like a one dimensional harmonic oscillator, it's more like a two dimensional thing, right? I mean, this isn't a two dimensional harmonic oscillator. This is two one dimensional harmonic oscillators, right? Mm -hmm. Which is different from two from a two-dimensional harmonic oscillator. Right. Because it has different commutation relations. Um, but but in, in this case, what you should see is some box where it's going back and forth, if I'm not mistaken. This thing mm -hmm. here should correspond to, and we should be able to just construct it, right? What the, what the analogous, because we should actually be able to compute. Okay, so a question here for our putative harmonic oscillator, what is, okay, See, I don't know what A and A dagger are because those should be the creation operators for quanta in the harmonic oscillator, right? But right. since I don't know what the what an additional quantum in this harmonic oscillator is, I'm kind of stuck on knowing what A dagger is. I mean, I would think. Um, You know, in, in this particular setup, additional quanta, I mean, in this setup where energy is the flux of causal edges, all you have to do to get an additional, you know, non-interacting quantum of energy, basically, is to have some additional symbols here that are just completely irrelevant, right? I mean, you could just have a, is it in addition to X, okay, my speculation is that we can do this by just having, in addition to X, we can have a Y here. What will happen if we do that? Nobody's offering a speculation about, okay, so I claim this. We're just gonna get, uh, we're gonna get a growing thing. What the heck is that? Well, that's not, that's not the relevant thing. I mean, what is that anyway? I mean, so if we get that causal graph structure of that, what is this? What is this thing? Why did this happen? Okay, explain, Jonathan, do you understand why this happened? Uh, I think so. I mean, because you're basically, you're. So some of these things will resolve, but now some of them won't, right? Because once you've got to a thing with X's in it, you can't get to a thing with Y's in it. Well, so or we need some Y's in the same place. Okay, so, so let's, let's add something, which is That's an X, grow. Y converter. What happens if we add that? It should collapse it. Yeah. So if we go so what the heck is this? Blah. What is that? And why is this not doing what I thought it was going to do? Which is to essentially add... Um, let's see. 
Yes, those people are commenting we have to have two disconnected oscillators, but I'm still trying to understand what on earth um, uh, see, see various people are commenting here that you should understand what the 1D harmonic oscillator is. But the trouble with it is, this is one of the, this is one of the screwy things, is that that notion of a harmonic oscillator is a, is a deeply idealized thing. And the fact that in traditional quantum field theory, one decomposes a quantum field into a sum of harmonic oscillators is just because it's something one can do. I mean, the fact that one's decomposing it into momentum eigenstates or whatever that correspond to, you know, the, the successive pieces of the harmonic oscillator is, um, I mean, there's no actual reason why a quantum field should be described by a sum of harmonic oscillators. If you, if you have particles at infinity that have def definite momenta, then fine, but that's not what one is doing. And the notion of a bound state is a, um, the, uh, um, you know, the notion of a bound state is a totally messy notion in quantum field theory. In fact, it's, it's really, you know, standard quantum field theory is about, you've got asymptotic particles coming in from infinity, they scatter, described by some S matrix, and then they go off to infinity again, and you see what happened. And that's, you know, that is not about a bound state. And the, the, the interface between bound states and quantum field theory has always been a mess. Um, at least it was a mess back when I studied these things, and I don't think it's been cleaned up in the intervening period. Um, but so, so, okay, so we do have an issue here of what does a single quantum of energy mean in the case of this harmonic oscillator. If we can make a, you know, a reasonable idealization of the harmonic oscillator, I think we have a little bit further to go. I think the, the concept that is a recurrent state in the multiway system is a reasonable concept. Um, okay, I mean, can I give my conjecture of what a quantum, what adding a quantum of energy would correspond to? Sure. Uh, so I think in this particular case, it would be a, a new uh, set of rules that would effectively allow you to skip two layers in the causal graph, if you see what I mean. Yeah, I see what you mean. So it would I be, think that's actually, it would be, it would be A goes to XA. Well, why don't we just add it? Let's do it. Or A goes to XB, A goes to XC kind of thing. Or maybe just you're A goes saying, to A. Well, you, you're saying that what, what I should do is essentially a completion of some kind where I'm going, where I'm skipping one of these steps. Right. Which means I get more edges here which means we have, in a sense, more energy corresponding to those edges. Right, but the actual dynamics of the system are unchanged other than that. And that's what it means to be a harmonic oscillator, you claim. I think so. So, well, let's, let's just compute it. I mean, so what you're, what you're saying is that this is, so the way we can do it is all we have to do is take the first few steps here, right, and add those to our, right? So what we would do is we've got, um, so given this, we would compute, not the causal graph, we'd just compute the first two steps of this. Uh, that's not what I want. What I want is to get the effective, uh, how, how can we get that? We have a way- well, No, that, that's fine, but that's what you want. You want A, a goes to XA. Okay. Oh, I see. A goes to XA as opposed to BCD. Right. So your claim is that if I take, if I look at like, like let's say five steps here, your claim is that the, the next step of the harmonic oscillator will be a direct A goes to XA, then what? And then an A goes to XB, XC, XD. All right, okay, well, let's, let's look at that then. So, so what you're claiming is that it's this, so I, I can take this thing here, so let's say um, uh, uh, extras equals that, um, and then what you're saying is, that I want, um, uh, you're saying that I want all the ones up to here, or I only want the particular one, A goes to a particular thing here with a thread, is that right? I think so, yeah. We might have to tweak this a bit. <laughs> okay, so you're saying it looks like that, and you're yep. saying what I want to do is I want to take this- we wanna Well, we actually, we wanna drop the first two elements of that. I understand. I understand. So, um, okay. So here we want this to be appended to actually we want to join this 
with this. And we want to say that mapped over, uh, actually, I'll tell you what we could do. Why don't we just get rid of, well, do we need the A goes to B? Do we need these things here? Or are we just, I, I think we're gonna need to fold this. I don't think we, I don't think it's correct. I think it's a fold. Not yeah, to, yeah, you might be right, you might be right. And in fact, symmetry demands that the way that fold is going to work is that we have, that we get rid of A goes to B, A goes to C, and that we just fold these in. Yeah, yeah, okay, that works. Right. So um, this thing here, but now why do we need B goes to D A? Actually, that's my X A, right? B goes to X A. Right. Do I need those? Uh, yes. Okay, so I need B goes to XA, C goes to XA, D goes to XA, or I don't necessarily need the D. Uh, well, you, you're combining rules for a one-dimensional and a two-dimensional harmonic oscillator here. So if you're going to do the two-dimensional one, you do need a D. Oh, how about if I don't do the two-dimensional one? Well, okay. what, what should I do, one-dimensional or two-dimensional? I think it's probably easier to analyze the one-dimensional case. Okay, let's do the one-dimensional case. Okay, so there we go. Now what we've got is uh, we don't have any dropping. We just drop the first one. We just right. say rest of that. And so what we're doing here is we're doing a fold list of that over. Uh, am I completely confused here? No, I, I, I can't fold the whole thing. I have to do a fold of this, a fold of the join of this thing, right? Fold list that join over extras, over rest of extras, I claim. Okay, so that's the, apart from that first, why is there a BC there? It's not extras. Um, oh, it's, it's, the, the, it's the output of the other thing. It's the thread. I should have said thread A goes to that. Is that correct? Yep, that looks good. Okay, so there's our thing. And now what we want to do is for each of those, we want to compute the um, causal graph. So it's this thing here mapped over. By the way, the, the first of those rules is nonsensical. We should do a rest. Okay, so here we've got this and we do rest of that. Okay, so now what are you claiming here? So you're claiming, okay, that's our first well here. Let, let's just make these a certain height. Um, let's see, we want to say image size arrow, um, automatic comma, let's say 500. And I should never use that. I should say rules or something here. I should say rest of rules. Okay, that wasn't very helpful. Hang on. Oh, okay, yeah. what went wrong here? Um, well, can you look at the states graphs for these? No, no. Look, look. Something went horribly, horribly wrong. <laughs> this, this is nonsense. Look. Oh yeah, yeah. You've got dupl duplicated rules there. Well, okay, so for, hold on a second. For, first of all, there's this, right? And what we want to do here is to fold, there's something wrong with this piece of code. Yeah. We want to fold in progressive extras. Why isn't that working? We're just folding in more of these extras here. And that's A goes to B, but that's nonsense because it doesn't have the, the join in it. 
Oh, 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 oh. Very, very, very silly. Very silly. Look, what the problem here is that's the initial state. Yeah, this is just nonsense. That's the initial state there. And then what, we, what we're trying to do here is to say join hash one, hash two. That's more like it. Did I get this right? Is that the correct initial state? Uh, yes, if, but, but we should get, yeah, as long as we do a rest on that, then that's, that is correct, I think. Okay. That looks good to me. Okay, all right. You can remove the rest in rules now. Uh, something horrible is happening here. <laughs> Help. There we go. No, it's not actually obviously wrong, I have to say. It's not obviously wrong. Okay. Welcome to the next quantum state here. Okay, so that's that you claim is the ground state. And you claim this here has what the heck is going on here? Well, the first so claim bear in mind that, that that A goes to XA, that should be on the first layer there. Well, so let's do a layered, layered graph. What, what do you mean it should be on the first layer? Well, why isn't it on the first layer? Uh, because we haven't included explicit step numbers. Can we do that? Uh, yes, but it will screw up something. Hang on, wait, let, let me figure out the best way to do that. The problem is if we include, hang on. You may just be able to say include step numbers goes to true. I'm just trying to figure out if that's gonna obviously break something. Okay, so these are, but, but fundamentally what's happening here is there is more causal, there are more causal edges joining Given any particular layer here, you've got more causal edges joining that layer to the next one. Right, right. But the, but the crucial point is that because the multi-way, the states graph, the states in the states graph are still the same. So you haven't actually changed the sort of harmonic dynamics, if you like. Well, they're not the same. They've got more X's in them. Down here, we're generating states with more X's. Look. If we go for the closed time like curve type version of this, then we will not generate more of these things and we'll get something where it does exactly what you're claiming it will do. Okay, so if we don't generate X's, but we just plot, but we use, we, we include step numbers, then I think that's the right thing. Which is, which, which denies, which is kind of like unrolling the closed time like curve. Yeah, right, right. My only issue is, yeah, include step numbers always seems to me a bit like cheating because it's like, enforcing that your space be hyperbolic. Well, I know, but harmonic oscillators are some stupid idealization. I mean, this yeah, is yeah, fine, fine. Okay. <laughs> so I'm happy to do that. <laughs> right. I mean, I just don't believe in the harmonic oscillator thing. However, the thing I think is interesting is the thought that you could decompose a graph in terms of these periodic subgraph things. Um, that you could decompose the causal graph. You know, what is the Fourier analysis of a causal graph, basically? Um, so, question um right i mean the the uh, yeah yes marcus on our live stream is pointing out we're trying to do a quantum harmonic oscillator we're not just trying to do a spin a half particle here and i you know i i personally think the harmonic oscillators while interesting in their own right are a red herring with respect to um the uh um the 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 original question of angular momentum and I, I, I want to come back and we're going to run out of time here because I think we're going to run out of time. Um, I think I am supposed to be, um, yes. Um, the, uh, um, uh, you know, I still want to come back to this question about the, what is the, you know, what is a totally antisymmetric tensor? What is, uh, you know, again, a lot of those kinds of things are asking for volume form type questions, which again, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, okay. We know what a geodesic ball is, but we don't know what 
a, a P form is, do we? What, what do we think the analog of a P form is? Silence. We are going to, we're going to run out of time here, unfortunately. And um, th this is, uh, for purposes of people watching this, this is, this is what you get in trying to do real time uh, reality physics is, um, uh, we didn't get quite as far as I'd hoped here. I, I think, I am pretty sure there's a way of getting, um, uh, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure there's a way of getting um, essentially a quantum angular momentum out of, uh, uh, out of something related to a cycle structure of these graphs. That is my conjecture. And moreover, and I, you know, the, I, I'd like to try to understand that there's a, uh, the whole sort of spin network um, approach to quantum gravity, which is a bit different from the kinds of things we're doing because it, it assumes a background n-dimensional space, three plus one dimensional space, for example, very different from what we're doing where we build the space from the actual graph itself. But there's a, a notion there of thinking about that spin network graph where the edges in that case correspond to angular momenta. And I don't know what the analog of that is in this case at all, and it may not have an analog, but that's a, that's a case where one's sort of going the other way around of starting with, uh, um, with angular momenta. Um, and, um, uh, okay, Tally is pointing out, the obvious point is that the eigenvectors of the adjacency matrix are primitive flows on the graph at the analog of the Fourier modes. That's interesting. Um, yes. Um, all right, we, we need to wrap up here because I'm, I'm sorry to say, um, the, uh, um, we will get this by the way, guys. I mean, in, in terms of my, my intuition would be this is another four or five hours of grinding and we will get this and it will be very elegant and um, we'll then at the end of it, we'll say it was totally obvious and we should have had it in five minutes. Um, uh, okay, I am going to switch to a completely different live stream, which is a, um, uh, a, a briefing for kids and others about a physics project. Um, I've been doing um, live streams during this pandemic period, doing science Q and A for kids. It's been a lot of fun and um, uh, I, I've kept on saying in past weeks, such and such a thing works this way, I think, based on this theory of physics that we have. But now we can actually talk about the theory of physics. So I thought I would try and explain this theory of physics um, at, uh, at, a, at a totally elementary level, um, which means we don't get to talk about quantum harmonic oscillators, and we don't get to talk about commutation relations, and we don't get to talk about p-forms, and so on. Um, and I want to uh, try, um, uh, try doing that. And I think we have to wrap up this stream. So thank you to everybody for, for joining us here. We will continue to bash away at um, spin and we didn't even begin to talk about charge. We will, we will get the story of what spin is. We might, we might do something this weekend. We might do something um, uh, early next week on this. Um, it's, uh, um, uh, we're going to get it. Um, and it's going to be very elegant, but I, I'm going to be even more impressed if somebody out there gets it before we do. And I think, I think there's enough information that, that it's probably possible. Um, and I, I, think, I think it'll be really cool. All right. Well, I'll, um, uh, I'm going to drop off this live stream and I will be back on the other one in just a couple of moments. Okay. Thanks, guys.